So thanks for having me. Um, I'm a freelance developer um, doing stuff on top of databases. Uh, most of the time it's Postgres because I like it much more than all the other ones. And because you can do a lot of pretty, pretty things with Postgres. And Postgres does also have an amazing community. So what we are talking here about is something that is Postgres SQL MED. MED is not something shortcut for medical, it's for management of external data. And management of external data is in fact an SQL standard. So that is the address uh, where it can be found. And uh, there was a first version in 2008 and it took eight years to come up with a new version. Uh, there have been some slightly, some slight changes inside, but not that much. But it was worth enough to make another version. If you like to go through these standards and would like to have some fun not understanding things, I would advise you to have a look at it. Um, so that is supported by, for example, DB2. IBM came up uh, with this uh, implementation of the standard itself. So the, the, the idea was grown by IBM and they implemented that in DB2. And there is also sort of implementation in MariaDB, not in MySQL. And this is done with the concept of a storage engine, but it's really far away from the standard. It does work somehow or not but uh, it's not implemented in, in a standard way. And there are other databases who can handle sort of external data. Um, Oracle and SQL Server can handle CSV files as external data, but that's it. And Postgres does handle a lot of this stuff. They made an implementation that is named Foreign Data Wrapper. FDW is the shortcut. That's how it's named in Postgres projects. And there are different different implementation, read only and read and write. So it does mean that you can write into a foreign data source. So the installation is done as Postgres extensions. Postgres supports a lot of extensions. Some of them you have to compile on your own. Some of them can be installed by the fly. Example of the available foreign data wrappers are Oracle. Uh, that is available through PGXN. If it can be installed right as a package, and then it's PGXN install, that's all. With Oracle, it's read and write. Does mean you not only are able to read data from an Oracle database, you're also able to write back to an Oracle database, which is pretty funny. I did that several times because Oracle didn't have the features I needed or was simply too slow. MS SQL Server and Sybase, they are still the same in this environment because Microsoft SQL Server is originally a clone of the Sybase Adaptive Server Anywhere. Uh, developed, they, they split up in version 6.5. That was the first version where Microsoft invented their first own bugs. Uh, there is also an extension for MongoDB so that you can read MongoDB, it's not right. Uh, we have MariaDB and MySQL available. Both are read and write. Uh, there is also SQLite available, so it's available on GitHub. You need to get it on, on your computer and compile it and then you are ready. Um, this one is read-only so far because uh, nobody had the need to write into SQLite or demanded to have that feature. There is also a read-only for Hadoop files, file system, so it does mean you have access to a Hadoop cluster with standard SQL commands from inside the Postgres. The query goes down from Postgres directly to the external data source. There has been 
there's also more thing. There's an ODBC thing, so you can use ODBC as a connector, which means there is probably a lot of things available through ODBC. There's also JDBC, which I don't mention here. Uh, that does also work, so whatever you like, data is available. But that's not all. There is more. There are some special foreign data wrappers available. The first one is a file foreign data wrapper. Um, for everybody who knows copy from Postgres, the copy command has the same parameters as this file foreign data wrapper. Does mean you can include a CSV file and define what the settings are. Does it, does it have a header? What is the column separator, text separators, and so on? Then there is a Postgres foreign data wrapper that helps you to access other Postgres databases. So usually you have the concept in Postgres that Postgres has databases where, for example, MySQL and MariaDB uh, call things databases that are in fact in Postgres schemas. That's the reason why you can access in MySQL and MariaDB a different database from inside another database. In Postgres, that's not possible directly because databases are completely separated. But for this, you can use this uh, Postgres foreign data wrapper to access every other database on your current cluster, but it's not limited to that. You can also connect to other databases, other Postgres clusters, and it can even be done through several versions. You can mix up versions in Postgres and run that queries. There is one thing, one extension that might come in handy, that is a foreign table exposer. Uh, that one is a very special kind of thing because it's built for BI tools, because several BI tools are not able to access foreign tables. And for them, this foreign table exposer uh, publishes them to them as a table. So it's just like uh, making a matchup of something so that somebody else can translate it into their own things. Um, then there is the other chance is to write your own foreign data wrapper. There is a library called Multicorn for it is used Python, and with that you can really write everything you need to access. So everything that is accessible from Python would be accessible from Postgres. Um, Multicorn already has two implementations included. That does mean you can use IMAP folders. Um, so you simply can query IMAP folders with SQL commands and have regular expressions inside your SQL command and just see what you find and join that to every other data that is available inside your database. It does also handle HTML, so you can even get HTML sources and query them with SQL. That runs out of the box. That does also include uh, Atom and RSS feeds so you can query them with SQL. I will show you later how this does work. Um, in this example, I will use a database that is public available, that is the Chinook database. And I use data in Postgres, MySQL, CSV, and SQLite. To be honest, the MySQL is not MySQL, it's uh, MariaDB on, on my computer here. Everything is running local. So except RSS feeds. The Chinook table is about music stuff, so these are the tables that are in there. Um, so I won't use every table. I won't use, will use the artist table, and I will use the album so that you can see some albums of an artist, and tracks to see which tracks are in an album that belongs to an artist or was done by an artist. And we can also see what kind of music is on this album. And that's this is just that's not something I would advise you to do. It's just a showcase to show you what is possible with Postgres and foreign data wrappers. So what I will use during my talk is something named common table expressions, also known as, as with statements. Uh, who does not know what common table expressions are? Please raise your hand. Okay, I explain it. Um, that is an example. That is, it starts simply with this 
with this with that indicates that there is a statement that will be uh, passed and you can then afterwards select the data outside this bracket. So with recursive, recursive is uh, something that you can have uh, for each with SQL, which is funny, but it does work. And you name it T, then it's available under that name, and then it's the S, and then it comes in brackets, and then you can do some things, and then it returns some data that you are able to just use with a standard select statement. So that refers to that T up there. And it's simple, it has a result because it's everything that comes here, 100 columns, minimum, maximum, and uh, a counter on top of it. So the fun fact is that uh, common table expressions are sometimes very handy to separate or use several SQL statements in one statement at the end. It's a sort of uh, views running in a user environment. So the user doesn't have to create its own view. That is handled behind the scene by Postgres with this uh, common table expressions. So let's take a look at some data stuff. Um so we start with creating an extension in the current database for SQLite. So that is simple how it is done. You first have to create the extension itself, make it available uh, inside your database. So beforehand you have to compile that one of course, but that's the other side. Uh, but when it's compiled you need to enable it in your database and that does mean you have to create the extension inside your database. So fire that up. Next step would then be to create a mapping to an SQLite file or database. So that is does mean you have to create a server, name it, uh, give it a name, and tell it which wrapper it should use. And then it has some options. So here the options are very clear, only one. That is a path to the SQLite file. And whatever you put in there, it's not tested. So when you c whatever you write in here, you can fire it up. It won't work when there is no SQLite file. It doesn't check if the file exists or something like that. That's something you have to do because it simply creates then this server. So, and then we have to create, we use one table from there, we use the artist table from uh, this SQLite database. And also here, when you create the foreign table, it doesn't test anything. It just creates it and it will fail when you try to access it. So we create it, it's done, very fast, very simple. And now we see how it works because it simply is just querying SQLite through Postgres. By the way, we are running on a Postgres 9.5 um, for some reasons. Um, so here in Postgres, this SQLite table behaves like a Postgres table. There is no difference. The only difference is that the SQL command is passed by Postgres and SQLite because it fires up the query, give me all the data to SQLite. Um, currently there is some things that, so it's simply straight only getting all the data in. So whatever you are doing or calculating currently is done uh, on Postgres side. Does mean that sometimes it has to get all the data inside Postgres in memory, calculate over that, and then return the results. With Postgres 10 coming in September, there is also a group by that will be passed through the external database, if possible. If not, well, Postgres does the job then. So that was then creating an SQLite. 
So now we go to get the MariaDB. Oh, can you look here? Create a new extension for uh, the MySQL or MariaDB. Uh, the extension is always as MySQL. So we have to create a server again. Here we have some more parameters. We have a host, so that's localhost running on that port. That only does define where the server is, but what we do now is we have to create a user mapping because where should this MariaDB server could get what the username is to give us the data. Uh, there should be some security inside, but well, Postgres then does have a uh, password and username, so it's there in. Uh, you need that mapping that, that does map your Postgres user to the MariaDB user. It just fires it up, it doesn't check anything again. It only will then go after we start to query. So here we see the same, uh, a little bit different because we have a database name here in. Uh, that is then the database name on MariaDB server and we take the table album. And uh, what else we have to do is we have to take care that we map the data types. So integer is easy, uh, character varying is uh, Postgres speaking, uh, which is simply a varchar. You have to, to take care that you map your data types from the original data to what is handled by Postgres. So fire that up. Let's see if we get some data. Well, and if you have in mind that uh, this only took 14 milliseconds, by querying Postgres, which where Postgres is querying uh, a MariaDB, that's not that bad. But the fun fact starts right here, because now we are able to join them. So we join an SQLite table with a MariaDB table and get the results without having the data itself in Postgres. So it does mean we can join nearly everything. For Postgres, for Postgres, it just behaves as an internal table. So just to make sure that uh, it's not possible to access uh, other databases from inside Postgres, I've got in this 9.5, there is a Chinook database uh, that has a schema public and that has uh, a track table, so, well, doesn't work. Also that doesn't work, raises a failure. Um, we also have to create first the extension itself. We have to handle the parameters to create the server mapping, so what I'm accessing here is uh, Postgres 9.6 from the 9.5. This 9.5 is running on 5.4.3.2 and uh, next one is 5.4.3.3. That is uh, 9.6. And you have one more parameter compared to MySQL because you have the host, the port and the database name. Haven't I? Oh, didn't create it. Okay, that can be solved. So create it. We have to create a user mapping again because the other Postgres database doesn't know who I am on this computer or in this database. So we have to create a user mapping again to make sure that the user has the rights and all these kind of things. So there is one different thing that is available when it comes to getting all the tables from another Postgres database. What we've done before was uh, getting the tables by defining them. That is what you see when we go up here. Uh, here we have to define, oh, a little bit more up. We have to define the table. So 
to really make that mapping. But a Postgres database does know a Postgres database since 9.5. And from there on, it started to have something new that is import foreign schema. And uh, you give the schema name where the data is coming from. And if you say nothing, then it takes all tables that are in the schema and import them as foreign tables in Postgres. Uh, but you can also put a limit to that, write limit to, and then you can just input all the tables that you need. Um, and then it's uh, just only that one table. So and now we're querying a, a Postgres 9.6 from a Postgres 9.5. And it's still fast. Eight milliseconds is OK. Um, you can also see that it is going external when we go here, because the execution plan says there's that's a foreign scan. So it tries to calculate some cost, but don't bet on that. It does only help to identify where the data is coming from, because the current the local Postgres couldn't know anything about the amount of data that is in the other database, if there are indexes when you access it, whatever it is. So it's only, don't, don't go for cost, but you can notice that the foreign scan. So that does mean we have now three foreign tables running, and we can join them together. So that one comes from uh, the SQLite database. That one comes from uh, the MariaDB. And this one from the Postgres 9.6. And when you see the execution plan, you see that it does a foreign scan. does mean it hash joins all these kinds of things. First, it gets all the data from there. It makes a hash join over that foreign scan of tables and does that twice and for every external table, obviously. So having four databases involved right now and having queries returning in 12 milliseconds is fair enough. There is no optimization done on any of the systems. The systems are installed just as they are. Well, and now we go on and create a file for a data wrapper. And we have to create a server again, because uh, that is a rule. Even if there is nothing, defiled that nothing else defined than having it's a file. That's the only thing that, is that it does say over here. And when we create that file, that is the same. It has some options. We have to define. Uh, where it is, and we have to say it's CSV, and OK, it does have a header. And if everything else is standard, then that's enough. But if you have tabs as separators, uh, you can define them. Or if it is, if the CSV is coming from some guy who uses a Windows computer and exported that CSV with Excel, well, you can define uh, the, the language code page that is used with that thing. If you don't define anything, then it's uh, UTF-8. So and that was querying the CSV file. So now the CSV file just behaves like the other file, like the other data says, sources too. And here it comes again. We can join them all together. So every column comes from a different data source, and all of them are external data sources. So we've already joined four data sources together, which is really nice.
But what we can also do is we can use joining these tables and using SQL, Postgres SQL expressions because the with statement uh, was implemented, I think it's in 10.2 in MariaDB uh, as far as I remember, but I haven't tested it. But in, in previous versions, uh, common table expressions haven't been available on MariaDB. But as the table, as the results are behaving as they are, it is that I can access them with Postgres things. So does mean we create here an array aggregate over the album tiles from the MySQL album and join that result with the SQLite artist data and say, well, we have this, for example, here we have ACDC. ACDC has two albums in there and this one has one, it's simply an array. As Postgres can handle arrays, which is not possible by MariaDB. So we can also create a little bit more funny things because we can create materialized views. When you use Postgres for that way to aggregate external data and make them available for researchers, for example, or for um, BI, then you can just do it with materialized views. Uh, so the data is then not queried external anymore. It's just handled inside Postgres. And when we have a look at that, it says now it doesn't take care of anything external. So this one is completely run inside Postgres because all data is saved in this materialized view. And that makes life later on a li little bit easier because you are not relying on the availability of external data. And you can use more Postgres stuff inside. So now I'll show you how we can write inside those databases. So okay, I do it. Click the Chinook one. So now we have uh, 347 albums inside the uh, MariaDB database available. And with this with statement, um, I create the data that will be inserted into uh, the MariaDB database as uh, this Chinook database doesn't have um, generated IDs. They are static. You have to add them. So I have to calculate them on my own, getting the max album ID and add one to that. Um <coughs> and then it is just I'm doing that with here, creating the data, selecting the data, giving it some name, say what data we want to have. We can have a look at it, how it looks before we insert it. So that is what it will be inserting into the MariaDB database. Inserted one row. If everything did work, Right, we should now see that one more. So it does mean I can even write into external data sources if necessary, if this data sources uh, can handle that. Um, well, if it doesn't handle that, you might use ODBC or JDBC because uh, in that case you have things also available. So, but when we query our materialized view, we see that there is still this number two and that the new album that we added is not in there. That's a materialized view. That has the data that was available at the time the materialized view was created or refreshed. So. Yeah.
here it's again only that we have two now we refresh the materialized view well and here it is the new album is inside and we have three albums in there but we cannot only add data into external data sources we can also remove them even the delete will be pushed down when I run it. So we still have here 348. Remove that record. Go over there. 347. Our materialized view will still return that it is 3 until we refresh it. Now it's 2 again. So you can insert, you can update, you can delete. So everything that's possible, uh, you can do. It does not work with every foreign data wrapper, only if it is implemented in that foreign data wrapper itself. Uh, as I mentioned previously, is done by the foreign data wrapper for SQLite, MariaDB, and Oracle. So, we can also do more magic with things in Postgres because Postgres is able to handle JSON as a result. Does mean we just access all the data we have here and there is one nice function that says from that result make a JSON. So every row becomes a JSON and even if it's external data, you can handle create JSON data inside Postgres and returning them. Transparent to everything that is handling the data elsewhere. So even that is possible. It's not that I should that I advise you to do it, it's only to show what you can do. So to make it a little more readable you see that uh, there's this nice little thing that is JSON be pretty. Uh, that does uh, do the formatic because uh, what we've seen beforehand was the JSON just in one line. Um, with that one, that's good for computers, but not good for us. Uh, when we have to read a JSON and it's all in one line, we are getting crazy. We don't get anything, it's a bigger one. And with that one, you see that uh, the complete structure so brackets inside records and so on. That's really nice and uh, just something that I really do like. So now let's see what we can do with this multi-core extension. We have to create it. And what I will do is I will create a foreign data wrapper for ISS feeds. So it's the same as we had before with text files nearly. You have to define a server, give it a name, and say which foreign data wrapper should be used here and created with, well, some options, which is that one, to have RSS feeds for that. And directly afterwards, you can create that foreign table. What you have to take care of is that the columns from the RSS feeds are exactly in the alignment of this. So title should be the first one, link the second, and so on. And also you have to take care of uh, when it comes to um, names with uppercase letters inside. Um, because otherwise it wouldn't find it because a lowercase letter is something different than an uppercase letter. Um, and this one only has one option, and it's simply the address of the RSS feed. So, creating the extension, but nothing is done. That's why it's fast. That's a little bit slower because it queries HTML, and now it depends how fast the internet is. It does say I'm connected to buzzwords it doesn't work, I have to take my mobile. 
I checked it before the talk and it did work. But that takes too long. No. There was something that didn't work. So let me take my mobile. Always have a backup solution. See, here it does work. Um, so the time that it does take is coming from, c not from, from the database, it's coming from how long does it take uh, to get the data from the RSS feed and how fast is your internet connection right here. Uh, so I query here the next Postgres events. So these are Postgres events that are coming and now we have them as available with a query and we can use Postgres to handle the data and do some stuff by sorting that and converting something into a real date. So everything that you can do with data is now available because uh, Postgres does handle that. Because it behaves for Postgres like a default table. So what you see here, there are some events coming up. So we have some Postgres conference in Philly and Seattle and there is the PG Day in Italy and we have in October, end of October, we have the European Postgres conference uh, that will be three days conference and minimum one day tutorials and that will be done in Warsaw um, this year. So But now we create another for another RSS feed because uh, we started with having some music data. So we now create another one that goes to music.com, uh, newsmusic.com. And what we can now do is we can join our table. The SQLite table is joined with the RSS feed and uh, the I like is a little bit different like it's, it's like the like uh, but it does all in lower cases so you it doesn't care about if something is upper or lower case it does put it straight uh, so I just said it would be very easy to do this so we can also add some more Select that one. Come on. Well, data are in there. We can join the Rolling Stone data with the data we have. And we see they have two news for you too, for whatever they are telling us. Um, and we can also handle more. I create them all right now. There are several music feeds. Did I create that? Yes. And now we can create a materialized view again where we just put in every RSS feed that we have created about music previously and combining them with a union and say what the source is and where it does come from and so on so that you can identify where the data is coming from. And that takes a little bit longer because it has to query every of every si every single one of this nice RSS feeds and now we create a unique index on top of uh, this foreign data wrapper because of other things so and now we see that we it's that fast because we are querying these uh, 
materialized view. So the data is not coming straight from uh, the external data, from the RSS feeds, but it is coming from uh, the materialized view. And here you can see where it does come from, and there is the address and everything that we had beforehand. And you also have when it was refreshed. So one good thing about materialized views in Postgres is that we have a refresh statement. Uh, and it does have this nice little word concurrently. Concurrently does work if you have a unique index on a materialized view. That does mean you can query the Postgres materialized view and it will return results even when it is, uh, even when it is uh, refreshing. So the data is available completely different than to Oracle when you refresh an Oracle materialized view and you want to drive your BI people crazy, do it on daytime, because then they have no data. And they are complaining, oh, oh my data is, done, is, done, is gone. So, so, and that does the refresh, and I would have been able to query it if I would have used a different client. So, and that's simply it about foreign data wrappers. So, any questions? Cool. Uh, we still have time for one short question, one or two, and then probably more conversation over barbecue. Anyone? And how about transactions? Well, it depends uh, on the external data source. For Postgres, everything is in one transaction. Uh, and it also tries so it, it pushes the data when it comes to an update, it doesn't update to MariahDB, uh, then the there is one transaction, and when everything is done, everything is fine. If it fails, nothing is done. For Postgres, Postgres doesn't care because it's external handled. So when you still have this nice little old uh, file structures of MySQL, then there is no transaction. That depends on the external system. Cool. Okay, last question. Is this a step towards uh, sharding Postgres? Well, yes, you can use it for sharding when you want to use external Postgres databases. You can query them uh, over different external data sources. I know companies that are using it for sharding, uh, but well, there are coming more things in the next version of Postgres that uh, will help with sharding a lot. So have a look at Postgres 10 for that. Cool. Or if you have bigger data, maybe Postgres XL is right for you, or Green Thumb, which is a Postgres derivative. All right, well, thank you a lot for the talk. And uh, thank you.